different about you? I can't put my finger on it. Mm. Is it? Yeah, that's it. I'm Anthony. Welcome to No Vacancy Lives. That's my friend Glenn. You're watching the number one show in hospitality. Hey everybody, I'm Glenn Hausman. That's Anthony Melchiori, the world's greatest timing. Go in and get your glasses. Boom! Sits down in the last quarter of a second of that uh, that roll in. How are you, man? Good, man. How are you? We uh, I was in the city last night to meet our friend Peter Crescetti. Yep. Evan and, uh, LW Hospitality Advisors. Advisors. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, just to get together, and then they didn't yep. like the place that they picked for drinks, so we went to Joe Isidori's. Uh, authors and sons and i i warned them as soon as we get in there yeah i'm gonna get quiet and you guys are gonna be crazy and of course joe is adore from authors and sons the greatest human beings ever lived yeah and, and it was like everybody was family it was great oh that is awesome i wish i could have done that with you i was here at the house resort pool club and smokehouse making fish tacos so there was that i'll tell you something he has a new yeah. place right next to authors and sons called authors and sons italian club yeah the day when you had the Italian club, that means you play poker in the back, you ran yeah. numbers, and you probably whack people and pretend that you were the contracts, right? <laughs> right. Really just a cool bar called our son's Italian club. Uh -huh. I forgot about this one thing that yeah. you don't know unless you grew up Italian with a mother that on Sunday night after we have a two o'clock pasta or one o'clock pasta, we get hungry about seven o'clock at night. Yeah. Find the best bread in America uh, at, with seeds on it, Italian bread. Uh-huh. Put regatta, fresh regatta, and you put some Parmesan cheese. Nice. And that's what he served us last night, one of the things. And I was like, no one knows, like, this is not a dish. This is like just your mother putting regatta on Italian bread. Yeah. Oh, my God. was it's, It was the greatest thing. I ate all of it. I, when they were talking, I was just stealing it all. And <laughs> my mother, we would dip it in sauce. So I said to him, yeah. I said, can we get a little sauce next time? He goes, yep, that's actually going to be something we're going to do. So if you have a chance, you're in the village, the greatest location right on the corner uh, somewhere in the Ville, I don't know where it is. Arthur's and Sons, uh, stop by. Now, I haven't been in Manhattan in uh, a while, but I was in Atlanta last week for the Hunter Hotel Investment Conference. One of the things I always make sure I do when it comes to food is check out Gus's Fried Chicken, my favorite uh, fried chicken in the, the country over there. But I was also, Anthony, you know, doing a panel while I was there. And the cool thing about the panel I was doing, it was about the brands, owners, and management companies and how they all kind of fit together. You forgot, yeah. one, you forgot one thing. What? The asset management companies. And the asset management company. That's that's very that is very true. Uh and I think I had one of those uh folks on the panel as well. All right. So because of that the reason it, I mentioned that is because in from my opinion from where I sit, that's kind of if you're gonna have a, a brand, a management company, ownership company, the asset manager has probably the most responsibility because they're the day-to-day -day communicator between all three of them. And yeah. if that asset manager is not an emotionally intelligent person, it can screw everything up. Uh, yes, but in order to set the stage for success, you know what you need? You need lawyers. And that's why we have over here Nelson Migdahl. Of Hi, Green guys. Hey, how are you? You are, of course, the uh, co-chair hospitality practice with Greenberg Traurig. Uh, it is so great to see you. Just saying off-air, I've known your name forever and ever. It is so much fun that we're finally getting to do some content together. How are you? I am great, and I'm I'm really thrilled to be here. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, recognize your names as well. Uh, you know, I I, I got to start by correcting a, uh -oh. a little bit of your opening comment. Yeah, please go you for know, it. I mean, uh -oh. don't, don't take uh -oh. offense here. It but, uh, if it's yeah. Italian food related, it might be uh, it might be a war here. But go on, Nelson. <laughs> The red line my opening comments. Okay, yeah. <laughs> there you go. There you go. You know that's what happens when you put a lawyer on the show. Yeah. Um, so and, and this is a great stop uh, starting point, right? Yeah. Awesome. So in 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 your first sentence, uh -huh. you mentioned owners. Yeah. And and I'm going to come back to this because owners today are different than when I did my first hotel deal in 1984, shortly after the ice age receded. Right. <laughs> then, then you mentioned brands, right? And of course, that gets you a little bit into the franchise space, mm -hmm. where you have a franchise agreement. Or today, we have all the collections, so you might have a license 
for a collection hotel. And are then you locally <laughs> known as soft brands for our listener audience. Soft brands, but then you also hire a separate person called the management company yep. or the operator, mm -hmm. third party operator. And then you also hire, as Anthony said, an asset manager to look over the shoulder of your um, operator. And then hovering in the background, you, ha you, have a, you have a lender. And you know there comes a time where we really have to pay attention to what the lender wants. It happens early in the franchise agreement because you have a comfort letter. And then in a completely different world, you have a subordination, non-disturbance, and a tournament agreement with a management company. Explain so, that for yeah. in women's terms. Yes, absolutely. Are, please do. Remember, Nelson, a lot of people that watch the show, not only do we have the top executives that pay attention, but we have a lot of young folks that are recently new to the business. So any it, anything you could explain would be super helpful. Yeah, my favorite, my favorite audience, right? Yeah. So um, I'm just going to talk a little bit on the management side first because franchise is easier, all right? So – you know, we we create a company, you know, Glenn Anthony yep. Nelson LLC, mm -hmm. and we are going to uh, build a hotel or buy a hotel, and we are going to have it managed by a management company, one of the big branded operators that we all know. Okay. Then we're going to go to a lender and we're going to say, look, you know, we have 50%, 65% of the cash. We want to borrow from you mm -hmm. the rest and they're going to say great i'm going to go through a lots of uh, due diligence and assuming we get to this point now we're later in the deal and the brand when you first are doing the letter of intent which i know we have to talk about yep. uh, may propose a form the brand form of subordination, non-disturbance, and a tournament agreement. What is that crazy yeah. agreement for? Yeah. The purpose of the SNDA, mm -hmm. which is typically signed by the owner, the lender, and the manager, mm -hmm. is to basically say to the world, look, you owner, um, you know, if, if there is a default mm -hmm. under your loan, we, the manager who just signed a 25-year or 30-year or 50-year management agreement with you, we don't want to get kicked out. So, you know, we want, we're prepared to subordinate maybe some of our fees to the debt service because the lender has got to get paid. Mm -hmm. But we want what's called non-disturbance. We want to know that the lender will not be able to terminate our 20 year management contract because you defaulted on your loan right without us having a chance to, to cure the loan or or do something else and you know what what has to be recognized is in the very state early stages of dealing with your brand or your manager yep. you may not yet have a lender often we are working on a hotel management agreement because Before. it's part right because it's part of the presentation right. to okay. the lender and the equity so nelson really it's a little chicken and egg kind of thing here i guess is what we're we're saying you have to have a potential deal before you can even go to the bank right but a lot of people think you got to have the money before you put together the the deal but that's not necessarily well, the case. Yeah, if i can jump in it's yeah, just, you know you know you need that for, for the bank. So it's not like they're already asking you before you ask them because you know you need it. <laughs> You're not getting it without it. Correct? Yeah, so, so here's where it gets sort of interesting because if you're not careful in, ha in how you express what you, the owner, will get from your lender, you may end up in you know, what we call the game of competing forms. Your brand had a form of SNDA attached to the management contract. Right. And now you pick a lender and the lender says, whoa, 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 wait a minute. We don't like this form. 
we want our form or we're going to negotiate this form. Um, so, you know, just to be helpful here and not just talk, you know, it, it's often really helpful if you're doing a management contract before the lending relationship to not have an absolute obligation, you know, owner shall mm -hmm. deliver that form. You may want to be owner will use commercially reasonable efforts to get that form or a comparable form. And we all recognize that we're going to have to negotiate the three of us with the lender to, mm -hmm. to look at that form as opposed to first sort of starting with your tail between your legs because you've already committed to form number one and the lender wants form number two. So all you want to do is hedge your bets there. Right. But, but as you, as we're saying, this is an important document, which by the way, often gets left to the 11th hour, which is a problem, right? You know, if you have a good legal counsel, good asset manager, an experienced owner, uh, any one of those, you're not going to wait until two days before the closing no, to right. start to negotiate an that, SNDA. That makes a lot of sense. So uh, I got a question uh, for you. Everybody really talks about you need to have a good brand in order to appeal to the bank. What about having a top 10, top 20 management company to show that the property might be a little bit more profitable if XYZ particular company you know, takes, uh, takes that contract? Sure. It's all about, it really is um, all about being able to be underwritten. Uh, you know, there, there are folks out there, probably many of your listeners yep. who are not yet hotel owners. They're sophisticated developers, but they do student housing. They do warehousing. They do apartment buildings. Mm -hmm. They do office buildings. And they're looking at hospitality as another food group yeah. for mm -hmm. their portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody has to get underwritten. So there are many owners who really are very, very happy to just have a big brand, manage it, take advantage of, you know, all the clubs that are out there, all the points yep. and sort of try to clip coupons, right? You know, yep. we're going to pay you and, and then just, you know, pay us, um, and that provides peace of mind. And certainly if it's your first hotel, your second hotel, mm -hmm. uh, the lender wants to know who the manager is. They're going to underwrite the manager more than they may underwrite the owner subject to the usual. Because you know, the KYC. manager has much more effect on the day-to-day -day operations than a particular owner who might be, let's say, the big convention center hotel, a pension fund, or just a you know, uh, somebody who's made a lot of real estate investment and has a select service hotel and doesn't know anything about the sector, right? Correct. And that's where it sort of gets fun, right? Mm -hmm. There was a time, once upon a time, yeah. where many hotel operators, all the big, the big folks that we know, owned their own hotels. Right. Right. It, that it is true. Let's just give a little history lesson for everybody. And that started to change in the late 1990s with what was called an asset light strategy. And the whole idea was to get rid of the real estate and convert the company into more being more of a marketing franchising type of an organization where we see a lot of hotel companies today. Nelson, please continue. Right. But let's 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 be philosophers, right? Even though we're business people mm -hmm. and commercial people, we, we have to understand the philosophy Yep. or else we, we don't know how to negotiate these things. Mm -hmm. So now the philosophy is I'm the owner and what do I want? I don't want to lose money. I want to have an exit strategy. Right. You know, I'm not, yes, there are times that hotels get bought purely for ego purposes, okay? But that's folks who are sovereign wealth, family offices, you know, this prince has this hotel, so this other crown prince wants a bigger hotel, all right? But that's not most of the world. So now you have an owner who says, Nelson, please, uh, you know, I, I like the hospitality industry, but I don't want to lose money. Right. And you have a brand that says, 
we love the authentic guest experience, guest facing services. You know, we want a good restaurant, we want a chef, we want a spa, we want 24 seven room service because we want our guests to stay not only at your hotel, but every other hotel that we own that has the same name. If they come to Nelson's hotel yep. and they have a bad time at the, at the Nelson, a blah, blah, blah hotel, they don't go to anybody else's True. hotel in that family. Right. I mean, that's but, just general consumer behavior, right? Correct. But, yeah. but under the asset light strategy, correctly identified by you, Glenn, thank you. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> you, have a, you have a situation where that owner is paying for all of those wonderful things that the brand wants to do which is not to say the owner doesn't want them either, right? Right, they, and a lot of times that includes share this. things like uh, marketing, advertising, those sorts Correct. of things, as well as investing perhaps in new programs and services that'll, in the end, supposedly help make those uh, owners and franchisees more money. Nelson, that, that's the key. That's mm -hmm. the key. But, but philosophically, it's important to appreciate that in the world today, the brand which which really you are looking to them to make you money no doubt about it mm -hmm. and many and many of them will do a far better job than if if nelson operated the hotel yeah but the but the cost is ownership all right under the asset light structure unless you negotiate for you know something like key money which you know maybe we'll come to later or next time owner pays for everything Yep. So the dynamic between owner and manager has sort of shifted. That's why it takes longer now to negotiate a full 20, 30, 40 year management contract because owner is trying to protect its cash. Mm -hmm. Operator wants to make sure it has the owner's cash to deliver the guest services under its brand standard. So with, right. so with management companies consolidating and there being just a few big companies and the brands now they're consolidated and even asset management companies, um, is that better or worse for the industry? Because when you were coming up in 84 and I was coming up in 84, it was much, it was very much different. And so now that like several companies run the world in the hotel business, is that good or bad in your estimation for the company business? Yeah. So, so here, here's the challenge it, it presents, Anthony. Um, it, let's start in the franchise world, but it's also in the management world. All right. The, the thrust is to have your hotels, if you're the franchise or, or the brand, everywhere you think you want them in a geological footprint. What are your key cities? You know, where do I have to be? Right. Owner is is looking at this and saying, "Look, I I will build um, or operate a new whatever your brand du jour is, but I want an area of protection because I don't want to compete with another hotel that's now going to be a mile away from me." Now, well, what okay, has happened? That's why that's why you in, invent a new brand that's. Five dollars cheaper per night, or more. That's and per night. <laughs> and there you go, and there you go, Glenn. Yeah. What happens is a couple of things. With the brands keep bringing on new brands, which will not be covered by the area of protection. Correct. So if if you are a franchisee, even if you're in a good spot, even if you love your franchisor, even if you're making money, there's no guarantee that you're not going to have a competing hotel that's five bucks cheaper right. on an ADR that is owned by the same parent as your franchise or, and you can't do anything about it. Well, no, well, fortunately the brands, what the brands will do is they'll offer it to you first, right? So they do come in, well, and, they do come in and do that a lot of times. You, you, you hope, but remember yeah, the true. brand because of the asset light, mm -hmm. that brand may not own that hotel. That hotel may yes, have brought, right. Right, they got a call from you know the brand. The brand say that again, Anthony. I said the brand will not own the hotel. The brand, no brands own hotels anymore, unless it's on. Right, 
There are some so exceptions, they, but generally speaking, they don't. There, there are exceptions, but they're for a particular commercial purpose, right? Such as taking a brand that's failing and writing the ship, and then right. sell, selling it all. You know, but um, the, if a if a owner has a site, has the money, and just comes and doesn't need anything from the brand. There's nothing that the brand can do to say, hey, I'd like you to talk to Nelson and have him invest in your home. Very true. So, Nelson, what I really think you're saying, um, and just to, to give our audience a real understanding of what's going on, is while all of these different people all have to work together in order for each of those individual components to find success, there are opposing forces constantly at play. If I'm a hotel owner, I don't want any other hotels coming to open up uh, around me, particularly from the same company. But if I am the CEO of one of the major hotel companies, it's incumbent because I'm a public company that I need to keep selling franchises at an ever increasing pace year after year after year. And when you get 3000 of one hotel brand, there's no more places to put that. So you're forced to create new brands by identifying white spaces in the market so you can come up with a rationalization to continue selling more and more franchises. So I think that, yeah. And Nelson? No, you're, you're absolutely correct. But it, but there's a sort of another point under your point, yes, sir. right? Um, even if you're doing a, a franchise or a collection agreement, that's mm -hmm. a, often a 15 year term yep. or so, or a management contract, which if you're you really going to have a full service, beautiful hotel, hot, upper upscale luxury, you know, that's 30 and years. This would be an example of a, a Marriott managing a property that you build that's under like the JW flag or something like that. Correct. JW, Ritz Carlton, yep. you know, all, all of that stuff. Um, it's important that your advisors, whether they're lawyers or asset managers, have some degree of not only deal experience, but emotional intelligence. Right. Because you as the fair. owner mm -hmm. can't enter into a 30 year marriage with right. a brand mm -hmm. hating each other, all right? It's, it's yep. doomed. And keeping the lines of communication open uh, is to me, the best way to be successful, whether you're on the owner side or the asset manager side or the world famous gigantic operator side, stuff is going to happen over right. a 30 year term, right? We've had 9 11, we've had 08, we've had the pandemic. You know, yep. we're going to have something else that I, I don't even know it's coming. Yep. And if you can't work it out in a collaborative way, there is nothing good that comes out of it. Just no, nothing good. Not, no, nothing good. But you know what I want to do, uh, Anthony? I think this will be uh, fun. When you first started, right, uh, these franchise agreements didn't really exist because they weren't really there until Courtyard by Marriott kind of invented that segment. Yeah, they were franchising, but it was a lot looser. Um, how much have these agreements changed from those early days, say pre-1990, uh, yeah. Until the day, thirty-four years later. I like that. Right. This is your idea, yeah. one. But go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Well, look. Everything is far longer, far more complicated. Yep. And you know, uh, folks may not uh, mm -hmm. appreciate this, but the franchise relationship for a courtyard, a Hampton Inn, uh, you know, choice brand, anyone you want to talk about. Mm -hmm. They are now uh, governed by the same consumer regulatory laws as if you were going to do a Krispy Kreme or a McDonald's. Right. So uh, now you have filings through the Federal Trade Commission and or some of the 50 states, not all of the 50 states are the same. Right. Um, you know, which, which has, you know, made it interesting um, because now – you know, the, the, there's a lot of things that are very, very, very standard, super standard. Yeah. And the, what I call the, the, the wiggle room, if you're a franchisee, has shrunk. Mm -hmm. Because a franchisor is not 
really wanting to make changes in your franchise agreement that would require them to make a disclosure in what's now called the federal disclosure document. So every time if, you change something, you have to re-put out a, a disclosure. Not, not not if it's not sort of material. There are certain yeah. things that you can do. Uh, you know, for example, um, you know, we would like all of our franchisees to at least talk with their franchisor about um, a, a pass on changes in brand standards, right? Mm -hmm. I'm opening a new hotel. It's a franchise hotel. On the day I open, yep. I'm 100% in compliance with brand standards. Mm -hmm. And I may have built a new hotel from the ground up. So everything is new. Hey, congrats. That'd be a first. <laughs> right. So you franchisor are yeah. welcome to alter your brand standards however you want. But think you're not going to make me buy new caseworks, new TVs, new mattresses, things that are not part of, you know, public health and safety for five years, six years, right. seven years, right? Because everything is new. Um, you know, right. For example, and sometimes they update logos and branding and you have to change your big sign out front to comply with that. And right. that is always a sticking point. So this is an important thing for something like that. Yeah, and, and as you guys are talking, every you know, I've been involved in every part of yep. this asset management, management company, brands, all of it. And you know, it really takes just people who are experienced and have really good personalities and emotional intelligence to go through it because these used to be wars. I mean, Nelson's being very, very nice and very professional and being very lawyerly, but these could be absolute knockdown, drag out wars. And I think as more of this is happening over the years and everybody, you know, very few own a lot. And this is happening so frequently. There's less of what I remember 15 years ago. And there's a lot more protection and there's a lot more um, civility, I think, in these relationships. Would I be right or wrong with that, Nelson? No, I mean, the whole point is to create stability. And look, even if I happen to have the pleasure to represent a smaller management company, 99% of my work is on the owner side, but mm -hmm. we do represent some management companies. It's great. You know, you may have a boutique -y lifestyle thing and you've got five hotels, eight hotels, but guess what? You get 12 hotels, 15 hotels, 20 hotels, you can't negotiate every one as a one-off right? because you have to manage that every single day. And, you know, how many people would you have to hire to say, oh, in my, in my hotel, you know, in Fort Lauderdale, what did I say about this? Right. You have to know that in every one of your management agreements or franchise agreements, this is what you say about whatever that topic is because otherwise you can't run the damn place. Um, and, and you need to have stability. Right. Also for me, if I'm an owner, I'm a franchisee, right? Yep. You know, I, and, I, and I have this conversation with franchisees, you know, you do the best you can to protect your franchisee, but guess what? If I'm a franchisee of a brand and I know there are 10,000 of this brand in the country, yep. I want my franchisor policing all 10,000 because if somebody has a bad experience in Orange County, California under that brand, they'll never stay at my brand in Fort Lauderdale. So, you know, we all benefit by having enforcement of standards. Uh, it's like the old, you know, Anthony, you've been doing this a long time, right? You know, the old Holiday Inn commercials, you know, know before you go, right? Everyone is the same. Brands are all the same. Now, the newer iterations, like the new Holiday Inn Express is amazing, right? Because they've changed. Mm -hmm. But know before you go. So right. that means okay, you're not going to change a lot. Right. Uh, Nelson, before we wrap up today, uh, give us one thing that potential franchisees should really be paying attention to with contracts that may have changed in the last couple of years. Uh, two things. Uh, well, the, the main the, look area protection, I think, is always important, despite all of the bashing we did of it. That's important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other thing is the transfer provisions. Most franchise agreements have a very long 
clause. It's actually one or two pages. The purpose of which is to limit the franchisee's availability to assign interests in the franchisee, right? You've been underwritten, they've done KYC, attached to the franchise is a schedule of who your owners are. So, so your advisor needs to ask you, franchisee, Right. What are your plans in five years, seven years, 10 years? Because if they think they know what they may want to do, then you need to start to have that conversation right away. Because otherwise, it, most changes in a franchisee ownership structure mm -hmm. of any meaning have to be approved by the franchisor. And the franchisors are not crazy. They're not unreasonable. But you know, it, it's really an important question to ask on the way in. Folks don't think about the way out on the way in. That's our job. Yeah, that's a great point. If you want to learn more about this, of course, you got to go check out Nelson Migdal. You could find them at gtlaw.com. That's gtlaw.com. Nelson, thanks so much for being here. Really appreciate My it. My pleasure. Thank well, you. Nelson, uh, um, yeah, if you favor, throw your uh, cell number in the um, your contact information in the green room yep. in the comments because I want to get in touch with you. Uh, we will say goodbye to you in just a second. But uh, Anthony, Hotel All Stars party tonight at uh, Margaritaville Times Square. Yeah, Margaritaville Times Square uh, invitation only. So if you want to go, DM me and I'll um, see if I can hook you up. Uh, mm -hmm. It'll be fun. We'll hang out, you know, uh, and we'll um, watch clips of the show. Excellent. I think that's going to be awesome. Wish I could be there. Tomorrow, 3 o'clock. Tomorrow, 3 o'clock. Tomorrow, important. 3 o'clock on YouTube. The first episode drops. 3 right. p.m. Eastern time tomorrow. That's uh, we'll be live. So, that will be live at 3 o'clock tomorrow. That is uh, 9 a.m. Hawaii time. All right. Be sure to follow us. And while you're following us, uh, subscribe to us wherever you get your audio podcast. Make sure you subscribe to uh, Hotel All Stars on YouTube as well. Remember, you've got one life, so blaze on and be kind to yourself. See you all later. Tomorrow, as a matter of fact, with the CEO of CASA. <laughs>